I'm um, Paolo Manuel Barrios. I'm the Secretary General of Comese. And it's always a pleasure to participate in these events organized by the Youthnet, which is a very important um, body of Comese. It was uh, the bishops wanted to have this consultative body of young people from the different uh, member states of the European Union appointed by the bishops' conferences. So to hear the voice of the young people on issues that are important for all of us and for the European Union, and also making the voice of young people being heard, uh, arriving to the European institutions. What are the concerns also of the Catholic Church and the voice of young Catholics regarding EU policies and the challenges that the EU is facing? I was thinking about the title of this meeting, uh, Being Christian in Politics and Society. And I immediately was reminded of the statement we made public yesterday on the 13th of March, a statement by the bishops of Comese, the bishops of the European Union, on the elections that we're going to celebrate in a few months, uh, the beginning of June this year, which are very important elections for the European Union. So this message of the bishops to all the citizens of the European Union, and especially to the Catholics, is for a responsible vote promoting Christian values and the European project. So uh, the bishops uh, invite us uh, to bishops invite us to um, to vote to go and vote. Uh, you, you know that the turnout in European elections is generally lower than the turnout that we have in national elections. So the bishops invite us to vote, to vote responsibly. And I think that is important. Uh, to, vote, to vote conscientiously, thinking about it. And to vote for Christian values, for the promotion of Christian values in Europe, uh, is not any Europe that we want. Uh, we want uh, a Europe that is reflects values that form part of the Christian tradition, like the dignity of the human person, family, the sanctity of life, the um, solidarity, subsidiarity, uh, those values that are that we consider fundamental. And we want also a vote. We ask also for a vote that supports the European project as something that is important and something that was born after the wars that devastated our continent as a project of peace, a project of unity, a project of well-being, of democracy, of freedom. And in this message, the bishops also make a call to the young people, uh, uh, inviting them to vote, to vote responsibly, to vote for the future. And the bishops also quote um, uh, a teaching, a message that uh, Jacques Delors gave in Bruges in, in, eight, in 1989 in the College of Europe. He was then, Jacques Delors, president of the European Community Commission. You know that he died uh, some months ago. At the, in December, and he said this to the young people of the College uh, of Europe. He said, for you are being invited to play your part in a unique venture, one which brings peoples and nations together for the better, not for the worse. Uh, so these were the words that Jacques Delors, you know, he was Catholic, he was uh, of the Socialist Party, a very important person uh, for the European Union as we know it now, and also for the relationship between the European Union and, and religions, um, who's one of the main promoters of the Article 17 dialogue. So he invites the young people to take part in this venture, which is the European project. So I think the title of the event today, Being Christian in Politics and Society, I think it's very very elusive of this mentality. Uh, 
as Christians, as young Christians as well, you are called uh, to take part in this venture. Uh, that is the European project. So with these words, I leave the floor now uh, to even uh, for the meeting to Emilio. Uh, and I think also uh, to Ruben, I think, uh, to, to Emilio and Ruben to continue with the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And welcome to all of you again. Thank you, Father Manor, for your words. Uh, as you mentioned, it is very important that young people are participating and are part of an engaged dialogue, not only with the institutions, but also at the local level and in their societies and uh, in their political um, environment. I will briefly mention the uh, structure of this webinar today. Uh, we will uh, start, Ruben and myself, uh, to moderate uh, this session. Uh, firstly, by asking some questions that the Comesa Youth Net has um has actually produced and actually invented and created for the speakers um, and then we will go into a more q a session where all of you participants will be uh, able to ask your questions and to pose your questions even to your comments to the speakers so that we really uh, engage in dialogue and we really uh, make um, make it real in that sense uh, we will close, try to close the Q&A around 6.25, so that will be uh, uh, some time also for us, for Nina and myself, to explain a bit to you and to show to you the uh, toolkit on the European elections that uh, Comesse, uh, both the Comesse Youth Platform and with the support of the Comesse Youth Net have uh, created together. But without further ado, I will just start uh, the uh, webinar now with my first question to Dr. Gonzi. Um, Dr. Lawrence Gonzi is former prime minister of Malta. Uh, he was very kind to accept this uh, invitation that we, uh, uh, that we sent him and we are very, very honored that he's here with us. Uh, and of course, um, Dr. Gonzi, your personal life and career has been very much involved into the political fields, in the political environment especially of your country, Malta. Um, but we want to go and start a bit um, earlier than, than the latest, let's say, engagement that you showed in uh, your country and ask you more specifically, how did you become interested in politics? And um, maybe was there uh, a figure and a particular person that inspired you to take on the political career? Thank you, Emilio. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, greetings to everyone, especially a uh, greeting to Father Manuel. Uh, best wishes to all of you from the island of Malta. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to join you for this webinar. Um, you asked me wh when I got interested in, in, in politics. Probably I, I, would, I would answer that by saying when I started my university studies in, in, the, in, the, in law, I am a lawyer by profession. And as you would probably understand, anyone studying law would at some point in time study constitutional law and then you start getting interested in politics. But there is a difference between uh, an interest in politics and an interest in what is going on. And there is a total difference then when you decide to contribute and take an active part in politics. Okay, so in reality, when I became a lawyer, uh, I loved my, prof my profession. I wanted to continue with my profession. Uh, but but at a point in time, the political situation in Malta, this was in the in the late 70s, beginning of the 80s, became extremely uh, delicate. Uh, there was an issue related to private schools and church schools in Malta. And uh, those of my age, let's say 30 year olds, 20, 27, 30 year olds, uh, had to take a decision whether we would be spectators and just, you know, armchair critics, uh, convenient armchair critics who would attend our meetings and clap our hands and support our, our speakers and our political party, um, or whether we were prepared to, to put our, our, our hands into the issue and contribute. And it was at that point when I decided that um, because of the political situation in Malta, um, I, I decided to try my best to help out in order to bring a change. You asked whether there was anyone who was who inspired me to politics. I'll answer that question. 
by quoting a Maltese politician who, um, who way back in the 1960s had, had decided that Malta, though a, a small island in the middle of the Mediterranean, 400,000 people, no resources whatsoever, nothing, just an island, even difficult for the island to have its own water. At the time, after 200 years of, of Malta becoming a colony, this particular politician uh, had a vision of seeing the island becoming an independent nation, uh, able to move on on its own. And I benefited from that. I benefited from a free university. I benefited from free medicine. I benefited from a society that eventually found itself as a full member of the European Union. That person really inspired me and showed me that with politics, you can really make miracles, actually. I, I think this already gives a very good indication of the transition that you experience from the university uh, level, let's say, from the context of your university to and the academic context to the of politics, which uh, is also really has to do in had to do in your case with timing, uh, with the, with the particular political situation, and this is very very interesting. I will give the word to to Ruben for the next question, so he can introduce himself and ask the question to Peter Merche. Thank you very much, Emilio. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Ruben. I am one of the representatives for the Youth Net of the Commissie, and I represent Belgium. I'm very happy today that I can uh, assist in this uh, in this webinar. Uh, the person I will be asking questions to is uh, Peter Merse. Welcome, Peter Merse. He, Thank is, you. Uh, Thank you. he is a Christian political analyst uh, asked to commentate on different political programs. Uh, and newspapers, and also a writer and a journalist editor for the Slovenian newspaper Domovina. Uh, welcome very yes. much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the first question I have for you uh, today is uh, is a very similar question about your background and your motivations. How did you get involved in journalism? And was there a specific moment that you realized you wanted to be a, a Christian voice in politics? Well, uh, yes, <laughs> I could say yes. Um, well, uh, I was very interested in, in politics from a very early age. I, I remember me being 10 years old or 12 years old or something like that, uh, watching the evening news uh, with uh, my father, then uh, asking questions, uh, what are they saying? What is it going on here? Why, why are they doing this uh, and so on? Uh, he was also quite involved in uh, civil society, not in politics, but uh, civil society. So that was uh, when I started uh, my interest, and it was just developing from uh, from that uh, time on, uh, continuing in high school and then later um, at the university. Although uh, the thing in Slovenia is that uh, I then choose. Uh, Kind of different career path for for a starter. So I start. Uh, I, I went to the University of uh, Informatics uh, because I was like um, uh, in Slovenia. If you if you know a little bit the situation, we were the former communist country, and uh, it was kind of um, let's say uh, not very uh, prosperous to be very outspoken as a as a Christian uh, in this uh, area of journalism and. Uh, politics so I kind of decided to first to to go to some other direction to be like independent and then maybe do some 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 work in, in, in this way but then uh, I realized that I'm way too more too much interested uh, for that so I kind of switched uh, completely uh, and um, started to to write um, uh, at first, it was more or less uh, a little blog, and then I was uh, actually invited by the editor at, uh, at the time at the Movina uh, if I would uh, become their uh, correspondent, and uh, it slowly developed to actually full-time career, so uh, that uh, I became a journalist for, for for that newspaper, and I'm still there. Uh, really enjoying it uh, so far so uh, yeah that's um, it was slow slow falls I was always interested but um, I was kind of afraid at the beginning so to if I will be able to like um, uh, earn enough if I will be able to, to to survive with this profession at the beginning and uh, that's why I kind of did some 
leaps uh, on, on, on the way here. But uh, I realize that uh, when something is really um, interesting you, uh, you just follow this career path at the end, so uh, regardless of the fears at, at the beginning. All right, thank you very much. Very interesting to see that you made your own path and followed your own um, uh, calling, maybe I can I can uh, call it, uh, to uh, to this new job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I, I would then take the, the word and, and go back to Dr. Gonzi, um, because you have mentioned briefly already the, the, the role of Malta and the, actually the belonging of Malta to the European community, to the European Union. And since you were prime minister, I think that's really where uh, the, the period of time in, in your career, but you will, you will tell us, of course, uh, where uh, the, the work, uh, the political work becomes more intense. Um, and what, what were the main changes that you would say Malta experienced after it accessed the European Union? Um, what were the advantages maybe that the Maltese people uh, in the end got from their belonging and their accession to, to such a big group of countries uh, for a small island, as you mentioned, that, that Malta is? Um, and uh, what was your role into that? How did you manage to make the island and make the country move into this group? Uh, that's a very good question. <clears throat> let me let me um, <clears throat> describe to you a, a very sweet uh, um, incident, no, not incident, actually, event that I had on the 1st of May of 2004, when we joined the, the, the enlargement of the European Union. 1st of May 2004, we were invited to Dublin um, to celebrate the enlargement of the EU and um, to, to actually take the first day as, as, as members of the European Union. And I was approached by Jean-Claude Juncker at the time, who was the Prime Minister of Luxembourg. You, I suppose you know who Jean-Claude was. We became very good friends. And uh, at the end of the ceremony, Jean-Claude asked, asked me, Lawrence, he said, um, get a glass of champagne, let's go outside. Um, and, and toast. Uh, and I said, yes, of course, but what are we toasting? He said, we are toasting a special occasion. Luxembourg is no longer the smallest member state of the European Union. Malta has now this privilege of being the smallest member state of the European Union. The smallest member state. Now, that in itself encapsulates the enormous debate we had over a long period of time to persuade our population, especially the young one, the youth of our generation, that this was the right step in the right direction. A tremendous change uh, that would bring uh, enormous benefits for the country. Today, 20 years later, uh, now, now keep in mind, because this is very important, it, uh, what I'm going to say applies, I would say, to every, every country. Those young people at the time, who voted in favor of a referendum for Malta to join the European Union. Those, those young ones at the time were 18, 19, 20 year olds. They are 40 year olds today. Young people who were born in, in, in 2005, 2006 and afterwards do not recall what the situation was before we joined the European Union. Now, let me explain what the situation was before and what, and what we have today, which we take for granted. Before, our young people could not go to work in the European Union, any, in any state of the European Union, without going through a very complicated process of work permits or visas, et cetera, et cetera. Our young people could not go to universities at, in the European Union, in a member state of the European Union, unless they were prepared to pay thousands of euros. So, so the opportunities that did not exist before we joined then started to exist after the 1st of May of 2004. And that brought tremendous change. Our factories, our workers, our exports could, could now enter the internal market of the European Union, 500 million, uh, a market of 500 million consumers. Our products, our services, our accountants, our lawyers could now uh, export their services, their professional services and compete on equal grounds with the with, with with the rest of of of, uh, uh, of our similar professionals in in the European Union, 
But more importantly, perhaps, we made a statement. Malta became, Malta made a statement of being a European uh, member, a European country with a European cultural heritage which dates back centuries. This was very important. When I was prime minister, one of my very first visits was to our neighboring country, which is Libya. You remember that at the time, uh, Muammar Gaddafi was the uh, leader of the Libyan um, uh, country at the time. And in my first visit to him, I think it was about a month or two months after I became prime minister, my first visit to him, the, the very first thing he told me was, you made a mistake, you should have joined the Arab League. And my answer to him was, of course not. We are European, our cultures are European, our values are European. And by the way, our people have voted in a free and fair election, which was in a referendum, and in, the, and in that referendum, they decided that we wanted that, that, that the decision was to join the European Union. So, in short, you ask, what, did we, what were the changes over a number of years that we achieved cultural? We achieved security and stability and the comfort that we are now a member of a group of nations that believed in fundamental values which we, which we shared. The advantages were economic, for sure. Uh, we benefited enormously from the policy of solidarity, which meant that rich countries, members of the European Union, put on the table millions of euros for us in Malta to be able to achieve a higher standard of living. A, a higher quality of life, which in fact has happened 20 years later, we all recognize. Okay, With, and, and, and of course, the, the, the point I already mentioned, free movement of persons and the opening up of, of, uh, of opportunities which we never dreamt of before. Please, and once those of you who are um, listening to us or following this webinar, do not take these things for granted. These are all benefits that were brought to us by, as a result of membership of the European Union. And perhaps the most valuable of all that was the peace and, and security that we enjoyed for a good number of years, um, thanks to the European Union. 70 years of peace and security in the whole of the European nation, which by the way, today, today is being challenged and, being, and facing enormous pressure. And this is why a vote next June is going to be extremely important. Because it now, if, if, if ever at all, now is a time when the European Union should come out as strong as possible to face the challenges that we are facing. Thank you, Dr. Gonzi. Yes, I, uh, we will delve into the, the participation in the elections also towards the end uh, of, our, of our webinar today. Please, Ruben, next question to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Merce, you already spoke about uh, the difficulties of on the religious part, uh, being Catholic uh, in your country, but also the political part of being a communist country. Um, but since 2004, Slovenia has been a member of the EU. And I uh, would ask you, how do you uh, look at the European project now as a Catholic political analyst? And uh, in what way does it maybe align or challenge your Christian values? Thank you. Yeah, just just to, to make sure Slovenia got independent and the, got rid of the communism in 1991. But um, yeah, just yeah. some remnants are still still there that uh, shape our our politics. And yeah, we were uh, the same. Uh, we joined the European Union the same day as uh, Malta. It was um, uh, also a big uh, big step forward. I think from for 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 many years uh, Slovenia was looking forward to. Uh, to joining the European Union to become part of this group of um, developed and uh, civilized, I could even say, uh, nations that the European Union at the time uh, was. Um, regarding the Christian values, uh, I think that the uh, European Union, uh, it was started as a peace project, it was started as a very Christian project uh, at the beginning, if you uh, if we look at the founding fathers of the European Union, these were very Christian people, uh, and they also established European Union on these values. But uh, since uh, since then, there is nearly 80 years, uh, and uh, in this time, many things changed. I think that Europe got um, a little bit, uh, it, it it slept a little bit on the on the successes. That it had, so it was a it was a very successful project so far. It still is. Um, don't get me wrong. Uh, it is very 
if, if we look now uh, and ask what where, where would be where would we be uh, without the European Union and where we are now, I think the, the answer is, is obvious. Um, I will not repeat because I think that uh, Mr. Gonzi very well uh, um, showed this these benefits. Um, the, the, the way I see the problems maybe here is that the um, European Union grew with the bureaucracy, grew with uh, uh, all this ballast, so to say, uh, in, especially in recent years and uh, turn itself very much to the left, away from the Christian values, away from the, um, the founding principles that uh, it was founded on. So I think a couple of years ago, there was even a debate about the European constitution and there was a huge opposition to mentioning that uh, Europe is actually founded on the Christian um, uh, Christian values. So that is that is a big thing uh, for me. Uh, that that actually scares a little bit uh, uh, me about the future of the European Union. So that's why it's so important to keep the track uh, and, and and keep the uh, so that European that we keep the European Union on the on the way that uh, it was supposed to be from the start. So. Um, I, I, I don't know if you follow the, the news, but a couple of days ago, uh, France uh, put abortion as a fundamental right in their uh, in their constitution, and um, um, Emmanuel Macron, as the, one of the most important leaders in the European Union, is also pushing on the European level the same thing. So these uh, th th these things are, are going on uh, these days, uh, and um, that is something where Europe is on the let's say kind of on the crossroads where we can ask ourselves which way uh, it, 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 it will go. So will it uh, actually start to go towards the um, extreme left with all these beliefs that are extremely contrary to the Christian um, conscious uh, and um, by following these principles uh, to the left, uh, it, it will challenge every, every one of us. Uh, Basically, in almost all European countries, we already pay for for, for abortions with our uh, with our taxes. We pay in some countries. Um, we are paying for the euthanasia. Uh, it's spreading um, more and more. We are. Um, uh, I think about half of the Europe already has. Uh, uh, Family values destroyed uh, regarding the Christian uh, Christian viewpoint on, on the family, and in some cases, even when you are um, uh, actively opposing uh, this uh, statement, uh, you're already starting to. It's not yet the the way as it was in the totalitarian times, but already you start uh, to get flagged uh, on social media. You start to get uh, messages. Okay, you were uh, on the uh, you're, you're making the hate speech and stuff like that. So um, it, we are still in very democratic uh, situation. We can choose. So we have free speech so far, but it is there are very strong um, currents that are pushing us away from here. So that's why it's very important. How do we choose? And uh, uh, that we ask ourselves, uh, uh, what are the basic values that uh, we are um, we are standing for, and who are the politicians, uh, who are the uh, future uh, members of parliament uh, in, in Europe, who will protect uh, those. Uh, also, on the other hand, it's very important to, to get the the, the good uh, measure because uh, on the other on the other uh, end of the spectrum, we have some of uh, some of the politicians who are trying to to pose as the protectors of those values, but they're also against the European Union or trying to dissolve or, or destroy the Union. So it's very important to keep in mind that we choose uh, the politicians who are um, for the Christian values, for our uh, standpoint, but uh, at, at the same time that they do not uh, destroy European Union uh, in in a way to protect uh, or, or in the way they believe to protect those values because I think they will do maybe more damage than good if if we go this this path. So that is a very uh, very big thing to consider where to cast the vote to to, to steer European Union on the right track and not uh, destroy it in the process. Hey, thank you very much. Interesting. Uh, maybe uh, a small question. Uh, about about your answers how do you 
how do you go about criticizing EU, but also being uh, wanting to be a part of the democratic process and the and the vision of what EU is with its with its roots in Christianity? Uh, how do you keep the balance without being considered a Euro uh, skeptic? It's a, it's a quite a hard question sometimes mm -hmm. because um, you have to be critical of the things that are wrong. I mean, uh, if, if there is a I don't know, the directive uh, in the European Parliament that is going going the wrong way, um, we, we need to be uh, critical. We need to be critical of the things that we see that are wrong. I mean, that is nothing um, that, it, that, that doesn't mean being against the European project. It means actually being for European project because by uh, pointing out to the problems, we can enable European project to, to get better. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, but but the truth is that um, uh, extreme left it's uh, always trying to portray uh, even uh, basic conservative mm -hmm. uh, positions as uh, anti-European. They actually change the language, change um, what is supposed to be European values, and they say, okay, you're against European values if you're for the family, if you're for the Christian faith, if you're not against, I mean, if you use the words Christmas, uh, <laughs> it was already in, if you follow the things in, in European Commission so suggested we should stop using the word Christmas. So, that's, uh, so if you are a conservative, uh, you have to, uh, I think it's very important to keep your your faith to keep and, and be strong in it so not not to hide um your your christian values uh, just don't don't buy uh that the only way to save european union is to dissolve it that, that that's the only thing that uh, i think it's important and um you have to you have to accept that uh if you if you stand uh, for the christian values at some point you will be labeled maybe as a fascist or as a as a you respect skeptic or something like that 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 eventually uh, uh will happen but in in bible it's already uh, written that uh, yeah if if you are for 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 the christ at some point uh, you will be uh, criticized you will be uh, maybe even prosecuted i hope not in europe but so far but yeah um that is that is uh, the reality and i think we should not be afraid of uh, afraid of this so uh, not 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 to step back first time that somebody will call us a fascist because uh, we want to save lives or uh, protect the family or stuff like that. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Back to Emilio. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, I will I will go back maybe, Dr. Gonzi, to um, your your beliefs, your your faith, uh, and. Um, I wanted to ask you when you entered politics and when you were part, when you were prime minister, and also later. I, I believe this is also something that really uh, touches you now uh, in the work that you do. Um, was your faith a driving force to get engaged in politics, or maybe a source of doubt when when you consider this decision? I, I say this because um, because it can be it can be something that that makes us ask questions about our involvement in politics i, I recently reread one of the eight beatitudes of the politician that were written by cardinal van tuan that says bless the politician who remains coherent true to himself to his faith and to his electoral promises uh, but that then of course comes the question to what extent do we compromise so how did you engage in this you know, conflict, uh, let's say, uh, mental conflict. Um, yes, first of all, let me just endorse what uh, Peter has uh, mentioned in his last intervention. Uh, and in reality, the challenge that faces each and every one of us, it, it, it's our convictions, it's whether we are prepared to stand up for what we, we, we represent, for the values that we represent and whether we are proud of those values and whether we are prepared to use all those arguments that we have and that are extremely strong to persuade our listeners, those who are working with us and even those who are on oppo in, in, in opposing parties, mind you, that in reality, the values that uh, we as Christians embrace and the values that I hope every one of us tries to put into practice when we are in the in a position to take decisions, um, I hope that, that we, we will show that those values have actually translate into, into benefits for our society. I mean, um, 
I once, one, I once was told that perhaps one of the best kept secrets of the Catholic Church is its Catholic social teaching. The values of Catholic social teaching, which are universal in themselves, and which I could argue, again, with, I mean, facing anyone from the left, extreme left side of politics or even extreme, extreme position, whatever it is, that these are values that they cannot dispute. If when we say that we are in favor of, of the value of every single human person, every person, I mean, how how can they deny this? It, would I would would I be afraid of making that argument when faced with the dilemma of migration and illegal migration, which is today such a hot hot issue, and 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 every time a politician starts to address this issue, he start, he or she suddenly risks being elected um, or not elected, you know, because uh, any one of us stands up and says, "Hang on." Um, I, I, I insist I should treat a, a migrant who lands on our shores in the same way, if not better, than a tourist who comes on a cruise liner, because that person has the same dignity and, and has the, even more needs than anyone else. And our responsibility as a society, it's not just about being a Christian, it's, it's the Christian values that inspires us, but anyone with a sense of humanity um, uh, needs to, to 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 embrace the issue of the value of every human person. So 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 my my argument is this: we should not be afraid of standing up for the values that we 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 represent. I have, and mind you, this is a reality that each and every one of us faces. We we, we are faced with 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 some difficult situations. Your, your question was: was it an inspiration for me to enter politics? Um, was it a, an obstacle for me to enter politics? When, uh, my Christian values, and and I can tell you that in my years, in thirty, nearly forty years experience in politics, in the very difficult situations I found myself in, those very exceptional situations, which were touch and go, which were also highly controversial. Or, in, or decisions that I knew were going to be highly unpopular, but I was convinced uh, that they were in the best interest of the common good of my society. It was Christian values that inspired me and my colleagues that the decision needed to be taken. I had faced a particular situation during the Libya crisis, uh, when suddenly thousands uh, of, of uh, um, individuals, individual citizens, etc., started escaping from Libya during the Arab Spring because of the um, of the, the the tragedies that were taking place on on in, in the in Libya in Libyan territory during the uprising by the Gaddafi regime. You know, Malta's role at the time was of welcoming as, as, as with open arms all those who who needed help and support um, and 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 whatever was required for them. To to uh, to go back to their countries and to their lives, etc. Difficult decisions, most of them unpopular, uh, but in reality they they proved that those values are the values that actually translate um, politics into real everyday action that are of beneficial to, to of benefit to the population and to, to humanity itself. So I would strongly uh, take a position that these values are the values that guide us in our decisions, especially in the difficult times. Thank you. I, 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 I couldn't agree more with the fact that this should serve as a compass, right? As a compass for us to, let's say, find a good orientation whenever the, the situation, the political situation, the social situation. I just spoke about migration becomes very complex and we don't know which way, which way to go anymore. Um, before giving the floor to Ruben again for another question to, to Peter Mersche, I will just um, remind uh, all the participants that they can already write in the chat or think at least about some questions that we will ask in a few minutes that you will be able to ask uh, in a few minutes to, to the guest speakers. So just as a hint. Please, Ruben. Yes, my, uh, my next question for you, uh, Peter Mersche, is uh, you already spoke uh, about the polarization. You spoke about uh, extreme left, uh, but there's also extreme right and uh, the political environment that we live in today, not only in our separate countries, in the EU, but also in the world politics. Um, do you have a 
a message to the youth or is there a way that you try uh, to convey the message of the gospel and contribute to a positive political dialogue and how can we as Christians uh, de-escalate violence and create that true dialogue? Yes, um, the thing is, if you if you look, uh, polarization is is the fact that we, we can we can see it, uh, and uh, sometimes if, if you are really real, uh, Christian values should be somewhere in the center. Uh, it's like a very very central thing. But uh, today, from many sides, it's pushed like on the extremes usually uh, on the extreme right but um, it's uh, kind of uh, imposed uh, position on on the christians i think uh, first thing is um, very important to keep the values that we have so that we don't compromise uh, with the values on the other hand to listen um, to other people so i think a very 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 big part of this polarization it's due to um, people not being able to listen uh, to each other. So um, when, when you ask uh, some questions, when you listen carefully to, to people from the other spectrum, you realize that you're probably closer together than you thought uh, that you are because of this, um, because polarization serves many purposes. Uh, it, it serves uh, media to, 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 to push the extremes that are more readable. It serves the politicians who are on the extremes to, to rally uh, more, more people around uh, these extreme um, ideas. Uh, social media thrives uh, on those. So um, it is uh, very beneficial for a few people uh, in, in the society to keep um, this way and to make us think that uh, we are so so polarized uh, that uh, we cannot work together. So I think these two these two things. So listen to listen to other people, but uh, not not for the price of uh, forsaking our own uh, uh, the values that are uh, like fundamental values. So if you keep you have to keep uh, the, the the basics, uh, the, the most important things, so the fundamentals. Uh, but then be able to to, to hear uh, because most of the most of the disagreements in, in politics, especially among people, is due to some frustration, some bad experience with uh, I don't know somebody went uh, heard something about church that is negative or had bad experience in in church and now it's like anti. Um, but in general, sometimes we are also the ones with the with the bad communication who are perpetuating. This, or we then uh, uh, even radicalize ourselves uh, to, 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 to become zealous in our uh, aims. So we have to be firm, uh, but not, 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 not radical if, it's, uh, if it makes sense uh, to you. Yeah, and yeah, sometimes you will hear. Sometimes you will hear that you are radical. So you have to ha you have you have to in, in, inside the community. You have to keep this um, to, to 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 understand when you are actually radical and when you are just portrayed as radical from the one radical side because it's beneficial to them to discredit you. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, you should be, uh, I I totally agree that you should find your fundamentals and where you stand for, and then try to uh, participate in the in the open dialogue with with uh, communicate about what our fundamentals are and why they are there so I think very interesting thank you very much Emilio yes uh, maybe a comment from you uh, Dr. Gordon what uh, Mr. Merche has said um, because you talk about also the church uh, and 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 faith and how do you maybe see very briefly before going into the the Q&A uh, how can faith uh, re become or become or re-become since we are witnessing a growing secularization uh, an element a presence in our political environments in the in the eu and especially among young people uh, yes as i was saying earlier and as uh, peter has mentioned as well i mean we, we have we have our own principles and our values which in reality are universal in their nature yeah i i i I, I, I listen to what Pope Francis has done during his papacy, and, and I mean his, his um, laudato si, 
his appeal for the environment. He, he the head of, of the Catholic Church, has brought to the fore, has brought in the, in, to the attention of the whole world our responsibility towards the environment, towards climate, towards taking care of what, what is precious for us. This is the head of the Catholic Church. I would have loved to listen to that type of, of, of presentation, I don't know, by the head of some major uh, state, which is not just a member of the European Union, but even somewhere else from other parts of the globe. I mean, it's a statement where we are listening to the head of, of our church saying something which is applicable to everybody. And whether you are a Muslim or a Buddhist or an atheist and don't believe in anything, you must agree with the statement that is being made. These are the values. And um, when I address groups of young people, I, I try to explain to them. I am a politician. I spent half of my life active in politics, not just following politics. As I said, I suppose everybody in some way or another gets interested and in switch on the radio, switches on the television, watches, um, I don't know, some kind of uh, discussion or uh, nowadays follows what influencers say on social media and, and, and this is carefully more to what influencers say rather than what leaders, uh, political leaders say. This is the reality. Uh, I'll make a small parenthesis. Yesterday I was watching Italian news and I was fascinated by an initiative that was taken by President Mattarella. Mattarella invited um, some of the most famous influencers in Italian society, in Italian social media, and invited each one of them separately to talk about one article of the Italian constitution. Now, that's a fantastic idea. There you have a new means of communicating. Influencers were talking about different articles of the constitution, and mind you, these, most of those articles include within them, within them um, values that are Christian, values that are part of our Catholic social teaching. This is wonderful, this is beautiful. So, bottom line, the message I, I put is, is, is put forward is this. Listen, politics is not a dirty word. It is not a dirty reality. It is, it is, it is a very powerful tool that can bring change in our societies. It now change, it depends what change you want to bring. You can bring a change, the type of change that Peter has mentioned last week, two weeks ago, when was it, that France introduced this fundamental human right of somebody to demand abortion, which is absolutely unacceptable and goes against the very nature of things, as against us that we, we our position with reasonableness is that we value every human person, including the life of an unborn child um, uh, that, that, that deserves, that has the right to live. So who's going to, to anyway, that it's a topic that we can take on and discuss as much as, as, much as we want to. The bottom line is this, um, we should, we should, we, we have a responsibility to participate in politics. And we have a responsibility to make the right, what we consider to be the right choices. In other words, choosing the persons, the individuals who can represent what is positive in human life and human nature and what will benefit us in the long term. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzi. Thank you. You concluded this I can first intervene. part. Uh, yeah, can yeah, I intervene, just a, Tonio, from Mota? Ju ju just a second, just a second. I think there were, now we opened the, the Q&A. There were two, qu okay. uh, one, one question that was already on the chat. So we will go first on on the this question that was, um, I don't know if Bram, you want to ask it uh, live uh, or maybe I should read it. No, I can read it. Uh, so Bram Slakers asked um, for a, Peter, a question to Peter. Um, what do you think of the political system in Poland and their, uh, let's say, attitude that is very conservative? Um, and then we have another question by Adrian Schwenkba. Um, concerning voting responsibly and making the good decision in the EU elections, I am worried in some way because I do not perceive there is a party or a parliamentary group which really sticks to Christian values. Um, those who follow uh, some Christian values tend to be Eurosceptical or totally against refugees, and those who are moderate are supporting the globalist agenda and some movements that oppose our values. So what is the idea uh, about making a responsible decision? And then 
And this, I think, can can uh, be asked to to both of you, to both Dr. Gonzi and Peter Merche. And then, yes, please, uh, Mr. Borg, you can you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, first, I think the question was regarding uh, Poland. Um, as far as uh, I mean. Uh, as far as I follow the the, the situation, it's uh, always we, we first need to have in mind that no 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 politician is perfect. So if we expect uh, that we will have the perfect politician, um, we will be always uh, disappointed. And the politics is usually or always uh, the uh, art art of possible, uh, as it's said. Or, uh, so choosing the, the the best or at least the least uh, the least bad if we don't have the best option. Um, so regarding regarding Poland, I've, I was very um, I was very happy when uh, I realized that um, the previous government asked the constitutional court uh, regarding uh, abortion, which is a big topic uh, in, in in Poland right now, and the the, the constitutional court said. Um, that uh, it's against the constitution to kill a human person. So that's why it was more or less restricted uh, abortion from that. I, th I think we, we have to know as a Christians that it's not enough just to restrict the access. It's also very important to keep, uh, so to take care of women, to take care of um, education uh, in, in, in this regard, to take care of children, not to like uh, leave, the, leave them alone. Um, but in general, uh, I don't see. I don't. In, in, in this regard, I think it was uh, it was quite positive. It was not everything positive. Uh, many many things were were uh, also the mistakes that the the, the previous government made. Um, and uh, that's uh, you always have you, ha you always have the mix of, of, of options that uh, that you have. I I don't follow enough the Polish uh, politics to, to to tell which one of is like. Uh, the best option. I think you have to do it on your own. Also, I guess if the question is from Poland, they would they know better the Polish pot politics than me. Just uh, maybe to 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 finish uh, in in this regard. Um, regarding the refugees, it's always we need to see the person. On one hand, uh, also the, the the politics behind. Uh, so it's not necessarily. That, I mean, we will not uh, solve the problem with um, bringing everybody to Europe. Uh, especially not in the cases where, where there are big problems uh, emerging from here. So it's also a need to. In, in, this is also a very sensitive question as a as a Christians when we see a person who needs help uh, that that we help, but on the other hand, uh, don't let the, the I would say the uh, interests that are, for example, especially for in case of Poland, there was like influ the, the the refugees in this case were used as a political tool from the Belarus to. To to um, like destabilized countries. So um, in, in in this case, I think it's also important to have the rules in Europe uh, to be followed and to help uh, uh, countries of origin in a way not to because also just uh, taking refugees uh, it's it's in a way a problem here. Also, is beneficial here sometimes uh, because we get the the. the the workforce that uh, we don't have because of our low fertility. On the other hand, we take people from the countries of origin uh, that, that should develop their, their society and they're missing in, in those countries. So it's a very complex complex question uh, for just a couple of minutes. But um, yeah, it's it, it, we need to keep it in mind when, when we're talking about. So it's not like uh, it's not. It, I would say. Refugees, all, 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 all migrants welcome, uh, and uh, and and all, all, all migrants go away. It's always wrong, uh, uh, always wrong per perspective. You, you need to, to to look deeper. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Doctor Gonzi, uh, do you have maybe something to to say about this difficulty also in voting? And we also have um, uh, a question that goes more goes a bit deeper to the extremes. We've talked about extreme left, extreme right. Uh, how do we indeed um, position ourselves towards these uh, tendencies? Yeah, well, it depends on what issues we're talking about. Um, uh, I, I am, I, I, uh, my position is a very strong position with respect to migration in the sense that my first responsibility, our first responsibility is to save lives. And it would be a disaster if the decision by uh, 
the European Union itself is to have a migration pact that would place more importance on the financial compensation instead of bear, take, shouldering the responsibility of accepting uh, um, migrants, genuine refugees that are escaping from uh, the terrible situation that, that, that exists in their, in their countries. I, I, I am critical myself of the migration pact that has recently been adopted, even though in a sense it is a step forward. However, it, let's be practical. In life, steps are taken sometimes one step at a time. And sometimes progress is difficult. Um, it takes a lot of persuasion. Uh, as you all know, in the European Union and in the uh, in the in the elections in the forthcoming elections, there are the different political parties and the, po the po political families. I militate, and my party militates in the European People's Party. And our responsibility and my responsibility to start to try and influence the formulation of policies within within that political party. Commissaire should work within the political parties, whether it's the EPP or whether it's uh, other political families. Uh, work must start from, the, from, from, from there in order to fashion policies that are in line with, with, the, with the values that we espouse, with the values that we embrace. But, but I understand that these are not, ish, they are not, not easy um, uh, decisions to take. The, the, the most important principle is if you have our values, we either stand up for those values and, and defend them, or else um, we, we, we would be living a lie, a, a hypocritical position. So uh, it stands, stands to us. And I believe that we have a strong message to put forward that, that, that is persuasive as, uh, as well in itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I will, I will ask the last two questions, uh, always from the audience that we have seen in the chat. I think we already touched on the migration pact. Uh, we have touched a bit on where to stand and the diversity of the parties that we have, the extremes. Um, but one more question uh, addresses the religious, religious plurality of Europe. It says, how the increase of religion plurality is shaping the European democratic process? So a more general question. And uh, the last one is a question from Francesco Mazzina from Italy, um, who asks, beyond engaging personally in active politics, how else can we concretely stand up for our Christian values in the European context and fulfill our mission? Uh, Francesco thinks of meeting students in schools, organizing roundtables, uh, networking with uh, people from other countries, and so on. So I will briefly ask, still from your take, uh, Peter and uh, Dr. Gonzi, on these two topics, and then we can proceed to the end. Okay, um, in terms of uh, religious plurality, uh, I guess it means uh, Europe not being Christian anymore, but uh, getting more and more uh, different religions. Um, one thing is uh, we are, I think we, we need to understand uh, that uh, democracy is uh, basically something that derives from, from, from Christianity. Uh, it started uh, in, in Europe, more in the modern direct, uh, in Europe and, and U US um, uh, in, the, in this Christian background. And there is a specific reason why we have, uh, why we can have democracy and why it always failed uh, when we tried to export it to, to, to other countries. Because um, Christian faith uh, is fundamentally uh, rooted in freedom. So as a Christians, we have uh, freedom. Uh, we are we are not uh, religiously obliged to follow or or, uh, or I'll put it this way um, in in Christian faith separates state from from uh, from church from very beginning from from the gospel you have when when Jesus said give to the emperor what's emperors and to the God what is God's uh, we, I think uh, we have to understand that it's not the same for other religions as it is for Christianity because in, in for example Islam um, the, the the religious aspect and the government aspect are very much connected so when we are um, uh, when we are seeing these uh, changes in the society towards uh, away from the Christianity we have to be careful regarding this um, this situation because uh, people from different uh, people who are having different beliefs uh, can be 
democratically oppose uh, can, can democratically change the situation in case uh, uh, of, of them becoming the majority so this is uh, uh, I mean if you look around the world uh, I think you will see that uh, anywhere where they start tried democracy and there was not a Christian background it didn't really um, it didn't really go go well uh, it regard and, and also it, it's also it's also true for for the atheism because uh, Christians have above us uh, the moral um, the moral ground that is uh, uh, that we are rooted in and inside this we have the freedom to act freedom of thinking uh, you know different ideas that then can democratically take us to the best uh, to the better future not necessarily for for other uh, other religious and um, that that's that's to keep in mind when when we are seeing these changes uh, also regarding the second questions how to stand up i think uh, there is many ways if, if so why being active in politics is just one way um uh, it's also well you can support in a way you can can come to to, to rally uh, come to uh, to vote uh, to vote you, if you don't vote you are leaving this to other people so your values are not represented at the end uh, in the end result um by being informed and telling uh, about this to other people around us uh, to to be active in civil society um, and and push because we have to understand the politicians don't do everything in politics the politicians uh, if, if we want to some ideas to change uh, to shape uh, our countries I guess it's the first step is the civil society to change the perspective so if if by civil society we change the minds of people uh, those people then uh, demand from the politicians these actions in vote and the politicians in advance cannot do it because they need to be voted so if the people don't want it uh, they will not vote for the politicians who are trying to do it so the politicians are actually the second step usually in, in those cases also uh, in the shift of going left it was it, it was the same way it started at the universities started with the ngos then shaped uh, minds of people that they voted for the politicians who were then advocating for those things so uh if you if somebody doesn't want to get involved in in, in the politics as as it is in, in party politics have many many other options but if you go away of everything then um you're basically leaving out and uh, the christian way it's not the uh, surrender it, it's not uh, to uh, it, but it's standing so also the jesus stand for 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 his values and uh, uh, even ne if necessary throw some tables around uh, for, for, for it thank you peter of course and I, i'm sorry i didn't give the word to mr borg but he wrote in the chat that indeed uh, voting for candidates who are inspired by the catholic doctrine christian doctrine actually transcends political parties uh, and yes. so on. Dr. Gonzi, the very last, uh, the very last remarks from your side. Yeah, um, I would again endorse what Peter has just said and, and perhaps stress the important point he has made. Go out and vote. In, in June, you have a challenge. Um, all of us have this challenge that we, we need to participate and vote and make, make wise choices, which is the invitation that has been put forward. Um, uh, because if you do not vote, if, if, if any one of us does not vote, we will be strengthening the position of those who have totally different positions and totally different values than, than, than we have. So we have to exercise this unique privilege that we have. And I, I would end the, my contribution here uh, by once again repeating, politics is a beautiful tool to bring positive change to our societies. But for that change to take place, we need people with values that participate in politics, whether it's by voting, whether it's within civil society, or whether it's within um, political parties and eventually as, as a, in, in the executive of our different countries. So anyway, thank you for the privilege of being with you and for sharing these thoughts with all of you. Well, thank you. Thank to both, actually, to both you, Dr. Gonzi, and to Mr. Mersche for being with us today. Um, your contribution really has been very inspirational for us. I will just uh, now ask Nina, uh, my colleague, to share the screen because we want to give you a peek into a uh, sneak peek into into the um, uh, toolkit that we have as Commerce Use Platform and Commerce Use Net created together. 
Um, it's called Catholic Toolkit for Young Europeans. It's a compass for young people in view of the elections that we have talked so extensively about. Um, it has been written by the Commerce Youth Platform, um, and it's a tool for their member organizations to actually spread the voice about the European elections. You can see if we scroll down all the logos of, the, of our organizations. Um, and this is a toolkit with content and resources that will be published uh, next week. Uh, and so we really we will be sending you the toolkit, of course, uh, by email um, to all the participants of this webinar. Uh, I will give the, the word to Nina now to go a bit deeper in, in the content uh, of this toolkit. Hello, everybody. Um, so maybe just a quick sneak peek. Um, to the toolkit is structured into five main topics, and each begins with uh, a relevant quote from either like encyclical letter or exhortation. And then a topic is elaborated on deeper in the text below, as you can see, based on Catholic social teaching. And the last section of the page uh, are always questions for your personal reflection. So you can think about those uh, things before like making a decision. Um, and the toolkit delves into topics of uh, politics, citizenship, common good, European identity, and uh, critical thinking. And then uh, additionally, you can find here like practical information on the European election process and useful links, but Emilio will tell you more about that, I think. Yes, Nina, indeed, you can see a timeline of the European elections, of course, there are different dates for your country, depending where you come from. Uh, and the uh, links are mainly to European institutional websites, so you can actually click and find out more about how the procedure it, it is going to be in your country. And the very last page contains some sources. So the cyclical letters uh, of uh, very many popes that we have selected, some speeches and messages, and also some um, statements or manifestos of civil society organizations and European institutions that, uh, that talk about the European elections, especially this year's European election. And the toolkit, uh, of course, ends with a call to vote um, from 6 to 9 June 2024, uh, and it will be translated as well. So we really encourage you, once you will receive it, to spread it in your networks and to make it known so that uh, it will be useful for your friends, as we have heard from, from Peter, really to tell people around us about the elections and uh, what really matters in terms of values and in terms of what we want to see in the next five years. So I will end this here. And I thank you all again. I thank Ruben that helped us with the moderation. I thank Nina a lot. Uh, for her support uh, in shaping and making this webinar a uh, reality. And um, we hope to see you all soon, very, very soon, actually, for uh, another of these events. Thank you very much, and bye-bye. Uh, Thank you, Peter, again. It was Thank great you. to have you. Thank you. Yes, bye-bye. It, it would be great to answer the other questions that are also very interesting in, in the chat now. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. We could have had two hours more. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we go more in depth. Yes, 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 yes. Indeed. Well, thank you so much to all and have a nice evening.